what is computation? Well, why do I ask? Uh, we depend more and more and more on computer systems that get, seem to be getting less and less dependable. Not true, but it just seems that way. Uh, this problem has been with us for quite a while. Uh, many solutions have been proposed. Uh, they often involve tools for finding mistakes. And the, all these tools can be useful, but there's no magic bullet. And I don't have a magic bullet. I'm not going to tell you how to you know, make everything perfectly reliable. I just like to prevent as many mistakes as possible before they're made. And this requires just one tool that does not seem to be used uh, often enough. <laughs> this one. Uh, we need to understand the computer systems we build. And the first step is to understand what computation is. And this requires understanding what a computation is. So what's a computation? Uh, a computation is what a computer does. Well, perhaps not a big help, but it's a start. Uh, but what about a cell phone uh, or an iPod? Uh, I don't want to res uh, I'm going to generalize from what we usually think of as computers to what I'll call a computing device. Because I don't want to limit myself to what's you know, just labeled on your local uh, computer store as computer. Uh, and all of this will include non-physical devices, such as algorithms which you can't go to, to Fry's and buy, but uh, they are an algorithm is a computing device. Now, what was the world's first computing device? Uh, and the, to be precise, the world's first man-made, autonomous, self-powered computing device. Uh, it's the escapement clock. It was the first device that moved in discrete steps. Well. Aren't computing devices supposed to compute something? You know, the first gazillion digits of pi, or tomorrow's weather, or what the stock market was going to do next week, or something like that. Well, remember, a computation is what a computer does. And I don't know what your computer does, but my computer, you know, browses the web and does email and does very little computing to get answers. So we actually don't use computers very much to compute something and then stop. And our computers are continually interacting with the environment the way a clock does. A clock acts uh, just like our computers do. It's just uh, simpler. So uh, I would take as a nice example the hour clock, except uh, I've got 40 minutes, and hour clock is just much too complicated for 40 minutes. So instead, I'm going to take a binary clock as my example, a clock that ticks 1, 0, 1, 0, and so on. Uh, we can take, for instance, a binary clock whose output is a voltage. Uh, there's at least one inside your computer that uh, uses a convenient voltage scale going from 0 to 1, and it just ticks back and forth like that, and the one in your computer does it about once every 10 to the minus 9th seconds. Uh, and this is the way the uh, binary clock looks as viewed by the, you know, the electrical engineer who designed that clock. It looks something like this. You know, it will graph time, you know, voltage against time, and expect something like that. I'll choose a more convenient name. I'll call it V instead of voltage. Um, and what I'm about to take is an idealized view of the clock's behavior. And I'll look at it like that. That's the clock that the engineer would really like to design. There are just some little physical problems uh, with doing it. Uh, and when I do that, I can abstract away the notion of continuous voltages. There are just two values. It's either 0 or 1. Um, and it turns out that the clocks inside your computer, well, for most applications, uh, playing music, uh, maybe not, but for reading your email, it doesn't need to actually measure you know, real time. A uh, computer would work pretty much the same if the states uh, didn't last for the, all for the same length of time. Uh, as long as, they each, as long as each one lasted long enough. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to abstract away the notion of time. So the clock's behavior is just a sequence of states. And I can write it this way. Uh, now, I won't call it a behavior. I'll call it a computation, because uh, 
that's what computing device does. It computes. And this is a computation of this binary clock. It's a sequence of states. So that's what a computation is. Uh, now, I'll allow possibly infinite sequences of states. Uh, real clocks uh, aren't going to go on forever, but it's often convenient to pretend that they do. Uh, the same is true of systems. Now, the clock has a, we allow a computation not only that starts with uh, zero, but one that starts with one. You know, you buy a clock in the store and it just comes starting, you know, with some random value. Uh, so that's uh, an example of a computing device. So how do we describe computing devices? Well, we describe computing devices by describing all their possible computations. Now, the uh, clock is nice and simple. It just has two possible computations. But uh, you know, things that programs that get run on this computer have a lot more possible computations. So what language are we going to use? And there are lots of traditional approaches. People use programming languages or toy programming languages or things that look like that, or some things they call hardware description languages if their computing device is a piece of hardware. And one class of computing devices that people describe uh, is formal grammars, which describe how to compute all sentences in some grammar. Oh, things called specification languages and a bunch of things like that. Now, the languages that work, and I'm not going to talk about the lots of one languages that don't work, but the ones that work in practice describe a computing device by specifying two things. The initial states and a next state relation saying how a state can change. So here's a typical description that you ask a computer scientist to give you a description of you know, the binary clock. He might write something like this. They'll start with a variable v in the declaration. And what he's doing here is say v can be initially 0 or 1, so specifying the possible initial states. And then he'll write something like this piece of code. And what this piece of code is doing is it's a next state relation. It says how the state can change. You execute this if statement, and the result you get is a way of telling you how the state can change. Now, all these different languages have their uses, but they all tend to obscure the fundamental nature of computation. Because in computer science, people just get so hung up on the language that they forget to worry about what the language is actually supposed to be saying. So I take a different approach. I'm going to do what you know, real scientists do. Uh, I'm going to use mathematics. So I'll show you how to describe binary clock with math. Well, so the initial states are v equals 0 or v equals 1. Well, those two are mathematical formulas. Uh, what's this or business? You know, that's, that's English. So we need to express or in math. And that requires a brief digression, which is pretty much old news, I think, to most people here. But uh, in the beginning, numbers were quantifiers. You talked about two goats and three pigs and things like that. And mathematics was born when numbers became nouns. And operations like addition then combined nouns to form a noun. So this equation is a sentence. Well, it's combined uh, two operations, uh, two nouns, one and one with an operation plus, and gets a uh, second noun, uh, says it's the same as this second noun. But in the beginning, sentence equations were sentences, and equals was a verb. Now, mathematical logic was born when equations became nouns. And equals became an operation that combines nouns to form nouns. So this equation is just like 1 plus 1. That's, an, that's a noun formed by taking, uh, combining the nouns 1 and 1 with the operator plus. So this whole equation becomes a noun by combining two nouns with the operator equals. And that's a, a noun that names a value, a truth value, true. So that's a perfectly fine equation. This is another perfectly fine equation. Uh, it happens to name a different value than that, the value false. And that's mathematical logic. And a warning, 
Uh, mathematicians are very sloppy, and they use equals both as an operation and as a verb. And you have to figure out by context which they mean. And if you're a mathematician, you know, it's no problem. Uh, now, I'm going to use the equal sign as the operation, and I'm actually spell out E-Q-U-A-L-S as the verb. Uh, so, mathematical logic. It's a lot simpler than arithmetic. I wish people were almost, you know, were just almost as, as fluent with mathematical logic than arithmetic. It's, I mean, arithmetic is really so much more complicated. You have these infinite number of, of values that you deal with. But in mathematical logic, there's just true and false. It's really simple. You, know, you really should know it, you know, much, you know, slide it simply, you should be better at it than arithmetic. Uh, these are things are called truth values. And it has operations that combine truth values to form a truth value, just like plus combines numbers to form a number. There are mathematical logic as operators that combine truth values to form a truth value. The first one is called disjunction or or. And A or B equals the truth value true if both, if and only if both A and B are equal to true. So getting back to the problem of describing the uh, binary clock with math, the initial state, we have B equals 0 or B equals 1. Well, or we can now write in mathematical logic and put some parentheses around to make it unambiguous. So here we have a mathematical formula that describes the initial states. Uh, need a little bit more mathematical logic. There's another operation called and or conjunction. And A and B, I think I might have said or wrong. A or B is true if either A or B or both of them are true, and A and B is true if and only if both A and B are true. Sorry about that. So describing the, continue describing the binary clock with math. We have the initial states, and now the next state relation. Well, there are two, we're going to write the formula for the next state relation as a formula relating the current state and the next state. So I'll let V sub old be the value of V in the current state, and V sub nu be the value of V in the next state. So there are two possibilities. The first possibility, we can have the vold value of V equals 0 and the new value of V equals 1. Or the other possibility, the old value of V equals 1 and the new value of V equals 0. So that's the next state relation written as a simple mathematical formula. Uh, now, those subscripts get to be a nuisance to write. So I'm going to write, instead of V old, I'm just going to write V. And instead of V new, I'm just going to write V prime. So there's nothing magic there. When I'm writing an X state relation, the unprime variable means the old state. The prime variable means the new state. Um, and let's give these formulas names. So I'll call you know, init sub clock, the initial predicate for the clock, and next sub clock, the next state relation for the clock. Okay, so how do I construct a possible computation? Well, first I pick the, remember, a behavior, a computation is a sequence of states. So the first state, I pick a state satisfying init sub clock. And there are obviously two possible states, v equals zero or v equals one, and I'll just choose v equals one because I just want to display a single behavior. Uh, and then I have to find a possible next state. Well, how do I do that? Well, I find some value that when I substitute that value for V prime, the next state relation, next to the clock, is equal to true when V equals 1 and V prime equals that value. So I'm starting in a state in which V equals 1. To find the next state, I substitute v equals 1 for v in this formula, and then solve for v prime to see what the possible next state is. Uh, so let's do the substitution. Uh, and see. And now it's just simple calculation to find out what v prime is equal to. Well, 1 equals 0. That's the noun equal to false. False and anything is equal to false because sub and is true only if both of the operands are true. So that's equal to false. And false or something, well, false or true is true if one or the other is true. But since false 
is always false, that means it's true if and only if the second one is true. So false or something is equivalent to that something. So it's equivalent to, uh, to this. And then we have 1 equals 1. Well, we know what that equals. That equals true. And true and something is equal to that something, because both true and something is true, if and only if that something is true. So just simple calculation tells us that v prime, if v equals 1, v prime has to equal 0. So that's our uh, second state. And we can just repeat that. Uh, we substitute v equals 0 for v, and you can so if we go through it, you can see that we're going to get the only possible solution, again, is v prime equals 1. Uh, and now we've already done all those computations. Then we know if we substitute v equals 1, we get v prime equals 0. And we substitute v equals 0, we get v prime equals 1, uh, and so on. OK, so what have I done? I said a computing device generates computations. A computation is a sequence of states. A state is an assignment of values to variables. In this uh, particular simple example of the clock, there was just a single variable, but we'll see systems uh, now that have more than one variable. And a computing device can be described by two formulas. Init, a formula that just contains variables that describes the possible initial states, and next, a formula containing unprimed and prime variables that it describes the next state relation, how the state can change. OK, I'll give an uh, example you might find a little bit more interesting, Euclid's algorithm. That's a more traditional computation, 2,300 years old, computes the greatest common divisor of two positive integers. Well, what's the greatest common divisor? Well, assume d, p, and q are positive integers. D divides P means that D divided by P is a whole number. No. D divides P means that P divided by D is a whole number. I don't know how many times I've given this talk without uh, <laughs> noticing that, or without anyone in the audience noticing that. Uh, the greatest common divisor in P and Q, which I'll write GCD of PQ, is the largest number that divides both P and Q. So for example, here are the divisors of 18. 1 divides 18, 2 divides 18, 3 divides 18, 4 doesn't divide 18 because 18 divided by 4 isn't a whole number. Neither does 5. 6 is a divisor, 9 is a divisor, and the only other divisor is 18. Uh, and similarly, look at the divisors of 12. 1, 2, 3, or 4 are divisors, 5 isn't, 6 is. Nothing else is until 12. And of course, no number bigger than 12 or can be a divisor of 12. So these are the common divisors. And the greatest common divisor of 8 and 12 is 6. Now, give you some facts about the GCD. See, when you're, your computing devices are mathematical, you can you know, really do things with mathematics. Uh, so we use some mathematical theorems. So we have two results. Uh, GCD of P and Q equals the GCD of Q and P. Pretty obvious. The GCD of P with itself equals P. That's obvious because P divides both P and P. And P is obviously the largest number that does that. Uh, more interesting one and less common, that it, uh, though it's less obvious, that if P is less than Q, then the greatest common divisor of P and Q is the good set equals the greatest common divisor of P and Q minus P. Now, to my simple proof, I you know, like to I like to give proofs. I'd like to do it. But if I had an extra five minutes, I would. But I'm, I'm sorry. I'll just, you'll just have to take that on faith. So the basic idea of Euclid's algorithm is to compute the GCD of two num uh, positive integers, m and n. We can use two variables, x and y. And the trick is we're going to maintain the truth of the formula. GCD of xy equals the GCD of m and n. And that throughout the computation, that's going to be true in every state. And it's going to be true in every state of the computation. And uh, a formula that's true in every state of a computation is called an invariant. So it's that invariant that is what is the key to, to Euclid's algorithm. And we're then going to stop when x equals y. 
Now remember the theorem that says that the GCD of P and P equals P. Well, we can substitute X for P. It's a nice thing about mathematics, you substitute. Uh, GCD of X, X equals X. So when the, the algorithm is stopped, X is equals uh, the GCD of X, X by the theorem. Uh, and when stopped, X is equal to Y, therefore the GCD of X, X equals the GCD of X, Y. And by the invariant, that's going to equal the GCD of M and N. So when we're stopped, X will equal the GCD of M and N. And of course, Y will too, because we stop when X equals Y. So that's the idea of Euclid's algorithm. Let's write it to figure out how to write it down. The initial condition, remember we want to maintain the truth of the GCD of XY is equal to the GCD of M and N. So how are we going to get that true initially? Well, easiest way is we'll let X equal, one of them equals M and the other equals N. Now we'll let you do it this way. Uh, then what about the next state relation? Again, we have to maintain the truth of, of this invariant. Uh, to do that, we need to make sure that the next state relation implies that the GCD of X prime Y prime equals the GCD of XY. Because if, if that happens in, in one state, we have it true in the initial state, if it, if it, and we know if it happens in one state, it happens in the next state, well, that means it's going to happen in the second state, and because it's true in the second state, it's going to be true in the third state, and it's going to be true for all states of, of the behavior. So that's the, what we have to do. So how are we going to, going to we have to write the next state relation so it ensures that that equation holds. And we're going to use this theorem, remember? Theorem I just showed you. And so let's uh, substitute x for p and y for q in that theorem. And this is what we get. So it says if x is less than y, and x prime equals x, and y prime equals y minus x, then the GCD of x prime y prime, which is then the GCD of x and y minus x, equals the GCD of x, y. So this formula implies that the GCD of x prime y prime equals the GCD of x, y. So that's a good part, I think, to use. Now, let's substitute the other way around in this, in this theorem. Substitute y for p at x for q. And we see that the GCD of y, if, x, if y is less than x, then the GCD of y at x equals the GCD of y and x minus y. So that tells us that this formula, y less than x and this, implies that the GCD of x prime equals y prime equals the GCD of x, y. And if either of, and since this implies this and this implies this, then the disjunction implies it. Because the disjunction is true, if the disjunction is true, then one of those two formulas is true. And since each of those two formulas implies this formula, then that formula is true. So I've constructed this next state relation. <laughs> so that it guarantees that if the invariant is true in the starting, in the first state, then it's true in the next state. Okay, let's try it with uh, this algorithm, m equals 18 and n equals 12. So the initial state, clear there's only one possible initial state, x equals 18, y equals 12. Uh, and for the next state, Find the next state, we substitute 18 for x, 12 for y in the next state relation. We get this. Uh, this equals false. False and everything, anything equals false. False or anything equals that thing. This is true. True and something equals that thing. So the only possible solution is x prime equals 18 minus 12, which equals 6. Uh, and y prime equals 12. So that's the next state. Then we do it again to find the next state. Substitute 6 for x and 12 for y. Uh, once again, that's false. Uh, and that's true. So we get the only possible next state as x equals 6 and y equals 6. And now what about the next state? 
Well, we substitute x equal, whoops. We substitute x equals 6 and uh, 6 for x and 6 for y. We get this formula. These are both false. False and anything is false, and false or anything is false. For this equation, is, so this reduces to false, which means that there is no next state. There's no value we can substitute for y prime that's going to make false equal to true. So there is no y prime satisfying uh, the next state relation when x equals 6 and y equals 6. So that means the computation halts. And you can see in general the computation will halt when x equals y. So that's out in Newton's algorithm, I mean Euclid's algorithm, and indeed it completely correctly computed the GCD of 18 and 12, which we saw was equal to 6. Okay, so we derived the algorithm so it maintains the truth in every state of every computation of this invariant by ensuring that the initial predicate implies the invariant and if the invariant is true and the next state relation is true, then that implies that the invariant prime is true. Uh, so, summary. To ensure that a computing device does not make a mistake, for example, by producing a wrong answer, we ensure that some suitable formula is an invariant by showing that that invariant is implied by the initial condition and the invariant and the next state relation implies the invariant prime, the invariant with all variables primed. We also have to ensure uh, that the computing device does something that it should, for example, stopping. But I don't have time to explain how. So getting a computing device to work properly is a problem of mathematics. Now, reducing a real-world problem to, to a mathematical problem isn't the, isn't the solution, but it's a start. That's where science started. That's what, that's what science is. We reduce a real-world problem to a mathematical problem. And science has had you know, a few hundred years of, of being pretty successful with that. So I think it would be a good thing to, uh, for us to try in computer science. I'll take another example. Uh, alternation. Problem. Design a system that alternately performs two operations. We'll call them A and B. So the first solution I'm going to use is it, it uses a binary clock. And what we're going to do is perform an A operation when the clock changes from 0 to 1 and perform a B operation when the clock changes from 1 to 0. So Here's the ordinary binary clock, remember. Uh, I'm going to describe these operations by formulas, A and B, that just like in a next state relation, they contain variables and prime variables, but I don't care what they are. So I'm, I'm not going to tell you what those operations are. I'm not going to tell you what those formulas are. Uh, we don't care what they are. Uh, it turns out that it's important that V isn't one of those variables. Uh, but other than that, we don't care anything about what A and B are. So, we said we want an A action to be taken when, uh, when V changes from the clock changes from 0 to 1. So the next state relation of this uh, is, going to, is going to be this. When the clock changes from 1 to 1, it does an A action. Or the clock changes to, from 1 to 0, and it does a B action. So that's the next state relation of this uh, computing device. And because I want to start with an A operation, I want it to start with V equals 0. So that's the initial predicate. So uh, and there's also going to be some other formula which describes the initial state of those other variables, but I don't care what they are. Uh, so that's what our specification, that's what our mathematical description of this device, which I'll call the alternator, is. And it's obvious. It's a very simple piece of mathematics. We cannot read and understand it. And we can see that this is a computing device that alternately performs A and B operations. That is, alternately changes state in such a way that each, there's a 
cha state change that satisfies A, then there's a state change that satisfies B, then there's a state change that satisfies A, and so on. Uh, now, a little digression. Addition modulo 2, which I'm going to denote by this circle plus, and since I'm too lazy to keep saying circle, I'm going to start calling this plus, but you can put in the circle uh, yourself. And it's defined this way uh, by, by these uh, formulas. Uh, notice that the sum of the two values equals zero, of two equal values equals zero, and the sum of two unequal values equals is one. And adding one changes a value. They're very simple, it's sometimes called exclusive or by uh, hardware people. So it's the alternator. Now I'm going to define a new computing device by introducing two new variables, P and C. And I'm going to substitute P plus C for V. It's a beautiful thing about mathematics, remember? Mathematics, you can substitute one ex some expression for a variable. So that's what we're going to do. And we get a new computing device, one that has the variables P and C. It's got an initial predicate. It's got a next state relation. I'll call it alt sub, you know, for alternator substituted. Now, any computation of alt sub becomes a computation of alt if we consider P plus C to be the value of V. And then forget about the variables P and C. In other words, you write down a behavior, whatever it is, of, of this, of the alternator sum. It's going to have variables for P and C. For each, uh, for each of those states, you write down the value of P plus C and consider that as, and, and say, let V equals that. And then, if you forget about P plus C, we're going to get a behavior that's a behavior of alt sub because P plus C satisfies the same equation in, in alt sub as V does in alt, because we got alt sub by simply substituting P plus C for V. So what that means, since we know that any computation of alt sub alternately executes A and B operations, uh, and any substitution, any execution of alt alternates A and B operations, and A and B, you know, those variables haven't haven't changed, any computation of all sub alternately executes A and B operations. So this is a solution to our problem that we want of a system that alternately performs A and B operations. So we have another system that alternately performs A and B operations. Now I'm going to obtain another computing device that also alternately executes in B, A and B operations by making, by satisfying two conditions. I mean, its initial predicate the condition is going to formula is going to imply the formula of alt sub. And its next state relation is going to imply the next state relation of alt sub. Well, that means any behavior of HS is going to be a behavior of alt sub. Because its initial predicate, its initial state satisfies init HS, which implies init alt sub. Therefore, it also sat satisfies the initial predicate of alt sub. And any step. Of the, of the behavior of HS satisfying next HS. But if next HS is true, then next alt sub is true. So it also satisfies next alt sub. So it's also a next state, uh, a step of alt sub. And therefore, each behavior of HS, its initial predicate is an initial state, is an initial state of uh, alt sub. And every step it takes is an alt sub set. So it's a behavior of alt sub. So. And therefore, it's also a behavior that alternates A and B operations. So here's what I'm going to do. Uh, to get the init alt sub uh, behavior, uh, which says that P plus C must equal 0, I'm going to let P and C both equal 0. Letting did that implies that P plus C equals 0. So the initial predicate of HS is going to be uh, this formula. Now, to get the next state relation, I'll first concentrate on the, the first disjunction. Uh, we have P plus C prime. Well, remember, priming something just means in the new state, which means priming all the variables. So uh, that's just equal to P prime plus C prime. 
And now look at these two things. These say that P plus C equals zero and P prime plus C prime equals one. So the value of P plus C has changed. Uh, and there, there are two ways of doing that. We can either change P and leave C unchanged. And changing P means letting P prime be P plus one. Or we can change C and let P be unchanged. The only two possibilities. Well, I'm going to choose this possibility here. So I'm going to let P prime equals P plus one and C prime equals C. And that implies the, the correct condition that P prime plus C prime equals one. Uh, so we still uh, have a formula that implies uh, a, a next of all sub. Now P plus C equals zero. Remember two, uh, the sum of two things equals zero if, they're, if and only if they're equal. So that's equivalent to uh, P equals C. So we get this conjunct, this, this formula. And that formula implies the first formula of uh, next alt, next alt sub. I will do a similar thing for this part, except I'll have a change C instead of P. Uh, and that's how we get next to HS. And I've constructed it so that it implies next alt sub. And this algorithm is called the two-phase handshake. It's actually, it's a standard hardware signaling protocol. You, you'll see it in, in, in text, hardware textbooks. And uh, you can get you know, it very simply by just this simple substitution from the uh, really simple description of what it's supposed to do. Uh, actually, in this, P and C represent the voltages on the wire, which remember voltages are either zero or one. So one possible computation uh, is this. Uh, and you can uh, check it at home. Uh, I don't have time to, you know. But it's the same you know, sort of thing we've done, uh, done you know, twice already. Uh, so summary. I derived HS from alt by substituting P plus C for V. HS is said to refine or implement alt. Complex computing devices are designed by refining simpler ones. Refinement is mathematical substitution. OK. That's all well, I have the time to tell you about you know, how you use math uh, to uh, um, describe computing devices. I've been showing you all the wonderful things and how it really works. You know, this, not just on toy little examples, but you know, on really complex, uh, you know, on real systems. But the idea, what we've learned, is that a computation is a sequence of states, where state is an assignment of values to variables. A computing device generates computations. Possible computations are described by two mathematical formulas, and it and next, plus something else that describes what must happen, like stopping, that I don't have time to talk about. And you can reason mathematically about the computing device. Now, it's nice in theory, but you can't execute math efficiently. This algorithm is written in math, and it has to be translated by a person into code in some programming language like C. Actually, it's not true. I mean, we can execute this. We have a, you know, a, a tool that will execute the simple uh, algorithm like this for you. But uh, in practice, you know, when you start writing things as mathematical formulas, uh, you can't execute them efficiently. So if you need code, why write this math? Well, you can split the task of writing the program into two parts, finding the correct algorithm and coding the algorithm in a programming language. Euclid didn't invent all the algorithms that you're ever going to need. Pardon? So you write the algorithm, then you write the program. The program is a computing device that refines the algorithm. In principle, it can be described mathematically, and the correctness of the refinement can be proved. In practice, that's too hard. But understanding the principle helps you write the program. Now, people spend a lot of time thinking about how to do this part, but they don't spend time uh, thinking about this. There's this attitude that anything that doesn't produce code is a waste of time. And you'll hear that 
you know, and programs will say that. Well, thinking doesn't produce code. And I'm afraid a lot of the problems uh, is that, uh, that we have in our software is that people who write it seem to think that thinking is a waste of time. Now, many programs don't refine traditional algorithms, and the program, you know, part of his job is figuring out what it should do. So you have to design the program, you know, figure out what it should do before you write it. And math forces you to think precisely. And this doesn't apply only to programs, it applies to arbitrary computing devices. So design the computing device using math and implement, then implement. What about complex devices? Well, uh, I love this quote. I certainly wish I had heard uh, every, you know, a computer programmer say this, but you know, I wait in vain. They all seem to be very proud of you know, how complicated something they write is. Thinking is the only way to make something simpler, and math helps you think. But a device should be as simple as possible, but no simpler. Some devices are too complex to describe with math, and can't describe PowerPoint by two formulas in practice. But this doesn't make mathematical thinking useless. We decompose things into parts, design individual components mathematically. PowerPoint uses a lot of algorithms and protocols in there that need to be designed. And we can apply these ideas informally. It just helps you to write things, to, to write your programs, to design your computing device by thinking in terms of states, invariance, and refinement and substitution, even if you don't write any formulas. Anything that helps you think helps. Thinking, now, it's not going to solve all the world's problems. Thinking does not guarantee that you won't make mistakes. But I can assure you that not thinking does guarantee that you will.